Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Chris, so Chris might interject at some point. Um, uh, we work for the Intellectual Property Office. Um, as you can see from the first slide, um, we work for the Business Outreach Team, and our role is really raising awareness of intellectual property throughout the UK. Uh, who we are, we're a government agency, so we're not a commercial organisation, we're not actually selling anything as such. Uh, our role really is just to, as it says there, stimulate innovation throughout British businesses, uh, it being a small business, large business, or a medium-sized business. So we're based in Newport, we've got about a thousand staff, um, all sort of examining trademarks, examining patents, etc., etc., and that's our role. Why we think it's important is because in many, many businesses these days, the intellectual property is actually worth more than the, uh, the actual fixed assets. Uh, build the answer to real terms. If you think of something like Uber Taxis, the biggest taxi firm in the world, how many taxis do they actually own? Well, they actually own no taxis whatsoever. What they own is the intellectual property that allows people to book taxis. So in that business alone, the IP is worth probably tenfold than the actual fixed assets in the organization. And you should be applying this to your business yourself as well. What do we own in our business? What type of IP can we apply? What IP can we protect? So what is intellectual property? Intellectual property is just not one thing. It's just a collective term, an umbrella term, if you like, for a number of rights that businesses will be creating, generating, owning, and hopefully adding value to what they're doing. So back in uh, 1852, we opened our doors as the patent office to protect patents. But as time's gone on, more and more things have been added to what we do. So yes, we are also the trademarks registry. We are also the designs registry. Uh, we also cover copyright. Right, so if you've got issues with artistic works, films, that type of thing, we cover copyright as well. Confidentiality agreements, we would suggest that most businesses hopefully use confidentiality agreements. It keeps, it keeps things secret between you and the party you're dealing with. So if you've got things you want to keep secret between two parties, then pop one of those in place. Uh, trade secrets, not for everybody, but things like the recipe for Coca-Cola, etc., that uh, re is regarded as, as intellectual property uh, and a trade secret. The problem with trade secrets is obviously once a secret's out, no longer a secret, so one of the other areas might be better. And you can even protect new types of plant, seed, flower, if that's the industry you're thinking of going into. So just for the next 10 minutes or so, we'll talk you through the main four, and the first one we'll talk about will be that of a trademark, because if you're thinking of starting a business, then you are going to have a trademark. That purely is just going to be the name you've chosen to trade under. So it could be the name of the company, it could indeed be the name of the product. So uh, what is a trademark? Well, it's basically anything you can put down on a piece of paper and send in to us. Uh, it's got to be capable of telling you apart from a competitor, even if you're in the same industry. So to give you an example there, if you're buying a new pair of training shoes, you're going to your leisure wear shop and you'll see a wall with uh, training shoes with three stripes on them. They're quite nice. And on the other wall, you see a load of training shoes with swooshes on them. But you know the ones with three stripes are Adidas, the ones with swooshes are Nike. So those two signs tell those companies apart from each other. And indeed, what they're acting as is a badge of origin. I know whose products I'm buying, whose products I'm getting um, when I'm buying into those products. A badge of goodwill, a badge of guarantee, if, uh, if you like. So what can you register when it comes to a trademark? Well, the first thing and foremost you want to register is your business name. That tells you apart from anybody else in the marketplace, that's who I'm going to contact if I want to use your services. So your business name, your company name, is probably the first thing you want to register. But yes, indeed, you can register logos, you can register domain names, slogans, I'm loving it, just do it, etc., etc. Color theme. So yellow for breakdown recovery services, shapes, a tubular triangular bar of chocolate, music, non-traditional marks, all of these things can be registered if they're important to your business and you want to stop other people from using them. Before you do anything, however, our first uh, suggestion to you would be search. Make sure that the name you have chosen is free to use. <coughs> the trademarks register is fully available online 24 hours a day seven days a week go in there see what's registered and hope the name you have chosen has not been picked up by somebody else if then you want to register there is a fee included uh, which comes with trademarks a UK trademark will cost you 170 pounds that's for one trademark in one area of business the system is divided into 45 different categories you tell us which category you work in tell us what you do within that category and that will cost you 170 pounds 
We've also introduced the Right Start service. So if you're not sure about your mark, you can halve the fee. You can pay £100 up front. We will examine it, give you the results. If you don't want to continue, then all you've wasted is £100. If you want to continue, you pay the balance. We examine now within about nine days, 10 days. Uh, if it's not objected, nobody opposes your mark, then it hits the register in about three months. It's then yours for 10 years. So it's 10 years protection for as little as 170 pounds. If you do want to file overseas, which a lot of companies actually do want to do, um, then you can do so. You have the Paris Convention that takes your trademark anywhere abroad, really using that system. And you have to do uh, six, month, uh, six months of your UK registration. Our Friends at OHIM, uh, currently OHIM are changing the name shortly, but they will give you a community-wide uh, trademark, and that will cost you 900 euros. But that includes the UK, so don't do both. And if you want to do further afield again, so Europe and beyond, the Madrid Protocol enables you to take your trademark to China, India, USA, wherever you wish to go, by making one application. The second area we cover, so we, we cover brands, the second area we cover is that of a registered design. That protects the appearance of things. So if you're producing goods that people buy because of the appearance, that would be things like vehicles, lighting, cutlery, crockery, furniture, perfume items, perfume bottles, patterns, ornamentation. If that's why people buy your products, then basically you can protect that with a registered design. Registered designs protect the shape or configuration, pattern or ornamentation, no protection for the function, uh, that's where your patents come in and we'll talk about that in just a short while, and no protection if it has to be that shape to do its job, if there's no other shape it could be, then there is no design freedom and no design registration. A UK design application will cost you currently £60, that's for one design, um, if you file another one at the same time, that will cost you an extra £40, and they don't have to be related, so you could file a training shoe and a bicycle, they don't have to be related anyway, but it's £60 for your first, £40 for your subsequent ones, that then lasts initially for five years, but it can last for a maximum term of 25 years, so five periods of five years. Overseas again, you have opportunities to file abroad, again using the Paris Convention allows you six, a six month window in which to file your designs abroad. Our friends from OM, they will give a community wide design for uh, 350 euros and that again covers all 28 countries including the UK, so again don't do both. Further afield again, the Hague Agreement allows you to take your design UK, Europe and beyond, so USA, China, wherever you wish to go. So there are ways and mechanisms for you to take your designs overseas. The third area, just a couple of minutes, wonderful world of patents. Now patents protect invention, so how things work, what things do. Um, so we looked at branding, it protects the name, we looked at the design, which protects the appearance, or well, the patent protects how that actual product works. Um, three tests when it comes to a patent. So first of all, your invention must be new. So if you are coming up with new ideas, first test, don't tell anybody. Uh, keep them secret until you actually file your application for that patent because a prior disclosure can actually bring down a patent application. So really, don't sell one, don't talk about it before you file your application. Or if you have to, then obviously put a confidentiality agreement in place. The second test, uh, apart from novelty, uh, is now inventive step. Does it take us beyond what is currently available? Um, it, it, just because you haven't seen one, however, doesn't mean seen it's not new. Do a search. Again, you can do a patent search on our websites. And third and last, it has to be capable of industrial application or, and it has to have a technical effect. So it has to do something. So three tests, new, inventive step and technical effect. So providing you can overcome those three tests, we can actually then register and grant you a patent for your invention. So what's a patent? A patent is really just an agreement, an agreement between the state and the inventor. We will give you a monopoly, a monopoly for your invention. That will last for initially 20 years, but that's it, actually, 20 years fixed term. After that, anybody can do exactly what you're coming up with. So in return for that monopoly rights, we want from you some cash, uh, some fees. Our fees, relatively low, from start to finish, to get a patent granted in the UK, that will cost you £230. So not vastly expensive. However, you do have to provide us with a technical description, and drafting that description can actually be quite complex. 
This is why we suggest you use a patent attorney because that description does not only have to be technical, which you could probably do, but it has to be legal as well. So it's really complex things to write. That's why we would advise you to use a patent attorney. And typically, a patent attorney would charge you anything between two and five thousand pounds for drafting that material for you. But really, seriously, people who apply for patents themselves have a really, really low success rate in actually getting that patent granted or getting something granted that they will, will, be, will protect them. So really use a patent attorney. Get advice from a patent attorney anyway. Overseas, you have 12 months in which to file your patent abroad and most people don't just want the UK. So you can take out separate national filings within 12 months. Other opportunities you've got is the Patents Corporation Treaty. That enables you to put one application in and cover yourself in up to 148 countries. But the big money does come in in 30 months from your earliest declared date when you have to decide which of those 130 countries or 148 countries you actually want to uh, file in. And that's where the expense comes in because you have to file there and maybe you'll have to translate your material into the language of that country. So expensive. So again, get advice from your patent attorney. There's also a European patent convention. It's not a European patent as such. Uh, it's a bundle of patents throughout Europe. And again, you can pick and choose the countries you want uh, by making one application initially. So mechanisms and routes, again, if you're thinking of filing patents, get advice from your patent attorney or indeed from us, and we can tell you the best route uh, which is available to you. So the last thing we're going to cover, just for this 15-minute talk, is copyright. So we've covered uh, the trademarks for your brand. We've covered designs for the appearance of your product, patents for how that product actually works. The last area, which will affect actually every business, will be using copyrights. Um, is for artistic and creative works. Um, now, every business, I say, will be using copyright. If you've ever taken a photo, or you've got a bit of software, or you've got a website, then that's all covered by copyright. Now, the good thing about copyright, unlike the other rights where you pay money and you get certificates, copyright is absolutely free. As soon as the work is created, copyright exists in that material. There are no fees, there are no forms, there is no actual official register of copyright material. What it protects for businesses, well, it's all those things. So it's books, training manuals, technical manuals, painting, sculptures, engineering plans, songs, music, dramatic works, computer software, websites, all covered by copyright and all covered automatically by copyright. No fees, no forms. They exist. Copyright exists in that material as soon as it is created. How long does it last? Well, you've seen that a trend. Trademark can last forever, initially 10 years, but can last forever, provided you renew it every 10 years. Your design will last you a maximum of 25 years. Your patent will last you for 20 years. Copyright lasts for the author's lifetime plus another 70 years. So it's a very, very enduring right. Um, that's for literary works, musical works, and artistic works. For films, 70 years after the death of people who contributed to the film. Nothing to do with the actors, as you'll see there, all to do with the people behind the camera, um, which is why suddenly actors become directors and producers because then they have rights in the film. Sound recording, 70 years, and there is a publisher's right which you get. For example, something out of copyright that works with Shakespeare. If you write your own version of Shakespeare, you'll get 25 years for the way you lay that out on a page. Who owns it? And this is absolutely crucial for any small business because the first owner of the work will be the creator of that work, subject to being employed. Employed. Now, what we mean by being employed is that you pay their national insurance. If you don't pay their national insurance, they're not an employee, they're a contractor. And a contractor will retain ownership unless you put an IP clause in the contract. So no matter who you're dealing with, make sure IP is mentioned in the contract. Otherwise, the contractor will walk away of ownership of your goods. To give you an example, if you use the website designer to design your website, you've paid your money, you've got your website, well, actually, if there's no mention of IP, who owns your website? It'll be the web designer. But again, co uh, copyright can be assigned at any time. So all is not lost. You can contact them and say, well, actually, I do want to own my website. And Even if you sell your economic rights, there is a moral right over how that work is used. Most recently, uh, Adele asserted her moral rights when, um, uh, what's his name? Donald know. Trump. Donald Trump was uh, using... Um, her music for one of his political campaigns, so it does work. Just to show you how it works, here we have David Slater, he's a photographer, he went on holiday to Indonesia, took lovely photographs when a macaque monkey picked up his camera and took a selfie, that selfie was syndicated worldwide, 
um, Dave is a bit upset, he's getting no royalties from this picture. So he took it to court in America, wanted some royalties. Who took the picture? Well, the monkey did. So who owns the copyright? The monkey. Unfortunately, under US law, a monkey can't own copyright. So that is a, actually a free picture now. Anybody can use it. But that's how we work. So generally, the first owner of the work is the creator of that work. Bring it all together. There we have a simple jar of coffee that you will see on every supermarket shelf. As you will see, they have registered trademarks, which they signify by the R in a circle. It's a criminal offence to use that unless it is a registered trademark. They have an unregistered trademark, which they put TM next to it, because we know that TM stands for totally meaningless. It has no legal standing in Europe, and certainly not in the UK. So if you've got a mark, a brand, put a TM next to it, it will frighten people off. Register design, the shape of that jar. Copyright in the artwork labels, back and front, and patents in the freeze drying process, decaffeination process, etc., etc. There is our website. So if you do want further information, obviously give our call centre a ring if you so wish, or just pop onto our website. Have a look on there. Lots of useful information. Lots of search engines where you can go and search for your trademarks, your patents, and indeed your designs. And I say lots of useful information um, that could help you in benefiting from your business. So please do an audit, see what your business owns, and maybe apply it and start to protect the things that you're coming up with. Uh, that's been around 15 minutes, 15 minutes or so. So that's where we're going to end. So we're more than happy to take questions now. I'll leave the answer to them, or my colleague Chris will answer them. So Brilliant. any questions, please fire away. Fantastic. Gary, that was a whistle-stop tour. Thank you so much. You packed a hell of a lot in there. Um, for anyone listening to this, we will be uploading the slides and the audio of the presentation to the webinar page on Enterprise Nation so you can revisit it. But the questions have been flooding in uh, while you've been speaking. And so to kick off with, Rosalind has asked a couple of, sort of uh, related questions about, I guess, using other people's things. So she says, if I'm podcasting, what do I have to do to clear music tracks? And if I'm using images such as paintings on my blog or website, what are the rulings on that? So what's your what's your answer to those two questions? OK, so use of music, for example. So, I mean, a common one that we have is um, use of radio in a workplace. Um, so playing the radio in your workplace has the music on it. Um, generally, what you can do is sign up to PRS and PPL. OK, the two organizations, you can get a license from both of these, uh, enabling you to use the music. And it kind of covers both the producers and the um, kind of musicians as um, standpoints. You can get a license from them to use the works. If you're using it frequently in podcasts, you can give them a record of what you've used, and accept, and then they can disseminate the, the, the fees to the artists, for example. Um, what was the other question, sorry? If you're using paintings, pictures, that type of thing, again, yeah. you need to get licenses, unless it's out of copyright. As you said, copyright lasts for 70 years after the death of the author. So if it's outside that window, and basically you can lose very old stuff, but if it's relatively new, then you will need to seek permissions from the owners to use that particular material. Essentially, if it's in copyright, you need someone's permission. Yeah. There might be licensing agencies that can cover all those bases for you, but in essence, you need the permission of the owner. Right. I mean, you do see a lot of people who've sort of taken an image off Flickr and then have credited the Flickr uh, photographer. It, under law, is, yep. is, is that is that okay, yep. or should you have contacted? But that's fine. Yeah, Flickr have have what we call a Creative Commons area where people put their material up because they want it used, and they they still own the copyright in it. There's no you know they're still copyrighting that material, but they're allowing you to use it under that particular license. Now that license may mean that you have to nom uh, name them, uh, where you've got it from, or, or whatever. But it's still under copyright. But those guys are allowed to use the material material under that particular Creative Commons or, or Flickr license, yeah. Right. But that won't necessarily apply to every website that you find no. a photo on. If you <laughs> no. find one on a generic searching website, um, you know, you, you will need to generally chase up the, the, the rights from the owner. So unless you've got it from one of these websites, such as Flickr, which has got a terms and conditions that mentions it's in Creative Commons, you will need to get permission. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, Luke has asked, um, is a service IP protectable? Um, what, what's, the, what's the rules around protecting a service? When it comes to services, generally you're, you're protecting the brand for providing that service. So this, that depends what's obviously service. If you, if you say coffee, service, selling coffee, for example, obviously the branding, Starbucks or Costa or, or whatever the name you're going to call it, is protectable by trademarks. Um, some of the machinery they use may be patentable. The colours may be registered by trademark. The design, the look of the packaging, that type of thing, may be covered by registered design. So, so services are protectable, um, but at first of all, it's coming out with that great name to call yourself. You can't, can't protect the underlying theme, so you can't stop anyone making coffee. 
you can stop them making coffee under your brand, your license, your you know the, the look of your your shop, etc. Okay. Uh, next question from uh, John, who has asked, when building a computer software product, I know you, you did mention it briefly, but what are the general rules about what, what is possible to patent on uh, computer software? Oh, patent. Oh, that's a tricky one. That's always a hard one. Um, <laughs> generally, software is covered by copyright. Okay, it comes under the literary works. Okay. Hello? Patent. Uh, um, Chris, just to sorry, confuse Chris, everyone here. In Chris, sorry to interrupt. We, sorry? We, we we lost you briefly there. So maybe if you want to just go back a bit, you went you went silent briefly. Um, patents. Okay, sorry. So software um, generally going to be covered by copyright under literate works. Okay, so it'll always be covered by copyright. Bear in mind that's not the underlying theme of the software. It's the actual way it's written, the code itself. Okay. Sometimes this can creep into patents, and it's a bit of a complicated one. Because generally in patent law, in the UK at least, um, we say that computer programs are not patentable. However, we do have exceptions to that exclusion to confuse you. Okay, so we say it's not patentable, but then we sometimes say actually sometimes it can be. Okay, um, yeah, it, it's really confusing, and and this is another main reason why you use a patent attorney, right? Because they will understand what these kind of rules and regulations around it are. Um, essentially, if it has a real world impact then it may well be a patentable product, okay? So, I mean, think, compare your computer, computer, uh, sorry, a, an app for a mobile phone, a computer game app for a mobile phone, generally that's not going to be patentable because it hasn't got that real-world technical effect. However, a piece of software that controls the braking systems on a car does have a real-world technical effect. So that type of thing may well be patentable, okay? Right. Both of these aspects of coding is going to be covered by copyright, but the function, if it has that technical effect, may well be patentable as well. If you are in the industry of software and you think you might have something that's patentable, do chat to a patent attorney. Please yeah. talk to a patent attorney. It, it is an, even more complicated than other areas of patents, I'm afraid. Yeah. Right, yeah. So don't, don't rule it out. You know, if you've got software, don't rule out patents, but get advice. Have a chat, and, and a patent attorney can tell you whether or not you, you're on the right course, or they might say, that's just copyright, mate. Right, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so that the person who asked that question, I think you yeah need to get the advice of a patent attorney there because it's um, it might be possible. Um, another question: um, When registering a trademark or patent, what are the easiest and or cheapest ways to get international coverage, including mainland China? Now I know Gary, that was something you touched on, but maybe you want to repeat yeah. the advice of specifically yeah, for, for it China. Sure, it depends really where 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 you want to go. If it's just China, you want. <coughs> then simplest system is just, just to apply there directly. And we've got an attaché out there called Tom Duke, and he can help you to actually do that filing for you and tell you and give you advice on that. But if you want a number of countries, including China, then the Madrid Protocol is going to be the, seat of the simplest mechanism because it allows you to make one application and then adopt various countries. I think there's up to about 76 countries you can adopt now. So you can do the whole of Europe, you can do China, India, USA. So that's the simplest mechanism if you want a bundle of countries. If you just want China, go like directly to China. And again, we've got guidance, uh, guidance book on that in actually registering your rights in China. And again, I say we've got an attaché there as well. Fantastic. Um, uh, that one's for patent. Sorry, that's for trademarks. Obviously, yeah. for patent. Yeah. Um, Gary, I think mentioned the. Oh no, you didn't mention the PCT application. PCT, yeah. Again, the same thing applies. If you're just going through China, you might just go through China. But the patent system has a PCT, Patent and Cooperation Treaty, uh, and that is a mechanism again, very much like the Madrid Protocol, that allows you to file on a number of different countries at once. Brilliant. Okay, so the PCT is the patent version of the Madrid mm -hmm. Protocol. Yeah. Kind of relatively speaking. Okay, cool. Um, we've had a, another question here. First of all, uh, there's a bit of a compliment. Thank you very much for an informative 15 minutes. So there, there you go, Gary. Um, and the question is, uh, if I design a cup in ceramics and make lots of copies that I sell, is the shape covered by copyright or do I need to register the design? You potentially uh, need to register the design. Copy, uh, it depends whether it's, it's regarded as an artistic creation. If you're going to sell sort of hundreds of them, the argument being, well, actually, it's not artistic. It's, it's, it's in a work of utility. So, you, But you can protect that with a registered design. There's also an unregistered design right. So um, it, even if there's no copyright on it, because it's not regarded as artistic, and only the courts can tell you that, um, there's an unregistered design which will protect you in the UK for up to 15 years and in Europe for three years. So even if you don't register the design, 
campaign, which is low cost anyway for 60 quid. Um, you'll have an unregistered design right in Europe and indeed in the UK as well. Right, cool. Um, uh, another another question here, uh, here from John, John, the same John has asked another question. On uh, technical public websites where programmers post answers to questions, including pieces of code, uh, can that code be used or is that protective even though it's visible on public websites? Does that come down yeah. to the website's T's and C's? Yeah. Or? Again, it would be like, like your Flickr yeah. one earlier. It very much depends on the terms and conditions of the website. Right. Okay. Um, again, like we said, coding is covered by software, uh, copyright. Um, so it would be whoever created it owns it. It would very much depend on what they said it's allowed to be used for, as well as also looking at the website's T's and C's. Yeah, look at the T's and C's. That's really important. I mean, people use social networking. Um, look, read, read the small print because you may be putting up your stuff there and losing rights to it. You know, you may be giving yourself, you know, giving your stuff away. Um, so really, do look at the terms and conditions as to where you're posting. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot more people do need to look at T's and C's on websites because I get the impression a lot of people don't do that. I'm, I'm guilty of that myself, probably. Um, uh, I think most people don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A, a question from uh, Yejide, um, who has said, um, when adding classes to a trademark application, do you have to add every term that is relevant to, for the class or can you just add the overall class term such as class 14 for jewellery or do I need to add all terms of jewellery under that class that are relevant to me or just jewellery? Bit of a complicated question there. Maybe you briefly want to explain. I mean, if you, if you, if you use the, the, broad, the broad terminology, then anything in that class generally you may be protected for. The argument being for someone who wants to use, you know, uh, say if you say jewellery and I'm just making rings, then the argument being, well, actually, you haven't specified what type of jewelry you're making. So, a bit of both, really. Again, this is where, where the advice from the trademark attorney can come in useful because he can actually then specify the actual terms that you're actually using. So, again, um, either or. They are looking at um, generalizing the classes. I know that that may be in, in the offing. So, there may be general terms that you can use rather than specifying specifics. You were actually using general terms that every country would adhere to. So that's in the offing, but we don't know when that might come in. But, but for the moment, it really is on a case by case basis. But when you do specify, make sure you cover everything that you are doing and may well be doing it in the near future. Mm. Cool. Um, uh, John has come back with another question. John, John's, John's very enthusiastic for this subject. Good on, John. Um, John, well, John. Well, well done, John. John. John has asked, does the IPO. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, but does the IPA have their own patent attorneys who could offer advice ideally for free? Uh, but I'm guessing you don't. But do you have any recommendations on how, how to find a, a patent attorney that could work for you? OK, so the patent attorney organisation is called CIPA, CIPA.org.uk. The, the flat answer is no, we don't have our own patent attorneys. We have patent examiners, but their, their job is to examine patents and make sure it's all valid. Their job is not the same as a patent attorney, so they can't write it for you. Okay, they can give you information about the law and how it all works, but they can't do it for you. They can't give you specific advice as to what you should do, um, just help you understand the process. Um, CIPA.org.uk is the website for CIPA, which is the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. You can get a hold of a patent attorney through there. Generally, they'll give you about 30, 40 minutes free advice before you have to kind of consider paying uh, and, and they offer you their services. Another thing to think about is there are patent libraries and uh, business and IP uh, business and IP centres or BIPCs dotted around the country. Uh, I think there's about 15 in total. Yeah. Um, a big one in London, so the British Library, for example, is that hosts a big one. Uh, um, Birmingham has one, and you can find a list online. Um, they will have services available for you, and most of them, I believe, if not all of them, will generally do what you call a CEPA clinic, yeah. where they have a patent attorney who will come in for a day or half a day. Uh, you book in a session and you can go in, have a chat to that patent attorney and they can help you uh, on your case specifically. So that's kind of that, that 30, 40 minutes free advice. They have a specific day where you can come in and chat to them face to face. Um, so, yes, there are options available to get them. No, the IPR ourselves don't specifically have them, um, but there are links there, as you can hear. Yeah, fantastic. And we, yeah, we, we work with the BIPC a lot, particularly at the British Library in yeah. London. So I would highly, highly recommend using their free, free very services. Good yeah. yeah, they're very good. And we run against <laughs> there, but that's that's a big plug. So I won't go on about that. Um, no, 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 <laughs> plug away. <laughs> small, uh, Startup Saturday, we run it once a month. Um, but uh, finally, the final question um, is on from Jude who has said uh, that, um, that they're looking to hire, looking at hiring out ladies clothing so can they register the service 
uh, can they register hiring as a service? Is 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 there any? Yeah, key? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, re no reason. Obviously, you you again, it's, it's trademarks again. So you, you find the relevant class for for hiring services. Uh, again, if you're not sure, look at someone who does something similar. Uh, do a search on them, and they'll tell you exactly what they're registered for. So if you open again, if you open in a coffee shop, do a search on Starbucks. It'll tell you exactly what they're registered for, and you can have a look at their classes and perhaps use some of the terminology as well. So yeah, so a trademark for hiring, selling, whatever you wish to do, yeah.